decades of silence and living a life in disguise, one local man has decided to share his story of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chicago mob and living to tell about it. His name is Red We Met, and from 1971 until 1988, he served as a paid informant to the FBI, testifying against organized crime figures of the infamous Chicago outfit. Now living in Northwest Florida, he's setting the record straight in a newly published book, Nobody Cares and What I Did About It. In a special three-part series you'll only see right here on your local 18, We Met gives his side of the story. Tonight in part one, hear from him on what it was like to be an informant. Red We Met is far removed from the life he once led, literally and figuratively. For nearly 20 years, he lived a double life. To the Chicago mob, he was a porn shop owner, doing business in an area controlled by the outfit and forced to pay a street tax. Then we'll just make, let's just make some money. To the FBI, he was an informant, willing to provide valuable information on several dangerous figures. Why did you decide to become an informant? That was because I, uh, the murders, the murders, they were actually killing people and putting people in trunks of car to O'Hare Airport, whatever. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a stop to some of this. I'm going to get into it. Nobody else wanted to do anything. They were all afraid. The man he met with was Special Agent John Osborne, who had been trying to get others in the area to talk for some time. It was more a compassionate thing, like, I can't believe this. Nobody cares. They don't care about the neighbor that's getting killed or the guy down the street that was murdered or some bookmaker or something that really didn't hurt people, but he was murdered. Nobody cared. Sometime after, he let the FBI install a concealed video camera inside his apartment. On September 4th, talking to Tony DeDino. I was deep, the deepest anybody ever got, they said. I felt like a chameleon. You had to just adjust the things around you. And you had your, your language, your swearing, whatever. You just had to be one of the guys. One of the guys he had to convince was Frank the German Schweiss, a notorious mobster with a reputation of violence. In his book, We Met says Frank learned to eliminate anyone who would oppose his agenda or get in the way of his pursuits. The mobster was 20 years his senior, but over time, the two developed a favorable working relationship. We were friends for 20 years. He trusted me. And coming up tomorrow at 5.30, we'll take you further into We Met's secret recordings of the Chicago outfit, including the time he almost got caught recording Schweiss for the FBI. Here's a sneak peek. There's uh, two small cords that go on a Niagara. The Niagara was underneath a, a lazy boy reclining chair, and he was leaning back in it. He put his hands behind his back, and it kind of brushed the uh, head cushion, and the wires were kind of hidden down the side while the microphone fell down on one side. Confessions of a Mob Informant Part 2 airs tomorrow, only on your Local 18 News at 5.30. Welcome back to Local 18 News at 5.30. If you were watching last night, we introduced you to a man named Red We Met, who spent decades in silence but is now coming out to tell his story. He was an informant on the Chicago mob in the 1970s through the 1980s, filling agents in on mob activity through a concealed camera that was hidden in his Chicago apartment. One of the men recorded was Frank the German Schweiss. He was a notorious mobster and was also called the Babe Ruth of hitmen. In part two of our three-part series, only on your local 18 news, here at 530, we take you inside Red We Met's secret recordings. And he tells us what it was like to be an informant. He was a very violent man, dangerous, most dangerous man I ever met in my life. When Red We Met describes notorious mobster Frank Schweiss, he says his reputation preceded him. As a paid informant to the FBI, We Met's job was to secretly record conversations in his apartment with several mobsters, including Schweiss, who would discuss everything from extortion to murders. This Johnny has been declared for years. There is no one who has the right to come in in our domain. We Met says Schweiss trusted him. How did he earn that trust? I was very quiet. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a time when he was telling me about a murder that he committed, and uh, he never called them murders. They were always accidents, according to him. But uh, afterwards, he said, uh, tell me about your work, what you do. And I got real serious, because I was chuckling, kind of. And I got real serious, and I looked him dead in the face, and I said, Frank, I never talk about my work. And he put his hand up, patted me on the shoulder, and he said, that's what I like about you, kid. As a powerful man and 20 years his senior, I asked we met if he looked up to Schweiss in any way. No, not at all. No, I looked down on him, as a matter of fact. 
all those people that did those kind of things that he did, I did not. I despised them. How many murders would you say Frank committed? Close to 80. In his book, We Met says he had many stressful experiences during his recording session. He points out one in particular in which he almost got caught by Frank. There's uh, two small cords that go on a Niagara. The Niagara was underneath a, a Lazy Boy reclining chair, and he was leaning back in it. He put his hands behind his back, and it kind of brushed the uh, head cushion that's in the back. And underneath each head cushion, there was a microphone. And the wires were kind of hidden down inside Well, the microphone fell down on one side. And it was like me looking at you. I could see it happen, but he didn't see it happen. He was leaning back with his hands clasped behind his head. So uh, I diverted his attention to it. Were you sweating? Yeah, at that moment I was. But no matter how stressful the recordings were, we met told federal agents he wanted to take down the biggest guy. And that guy was Frank Schweiss. Well, tomorrow in the final chapter of our three-part series, we take you to September 15th, 1988, the day that Frank Schweiss was arrested, and the following years in which we met testifies against him, as well as other members of the mob. Here's a sneak peek. Was there any point in time where you thought there was a weight lifted off your shoulders? The day they arrested Frank. The day they arrested Frank, September 15th, 1988. Again, that airs tomorrow only on your local 18 News at 5.30. Kelly, back to you. Jennifer, thanks so much. Welcome back. Now to part three of our series, Confessions of a Mob Informant. If you've been watching the last couple of days, we've been telling the story of Red We Met. For years, he played a dangerous role as an FBI mole in taking down the Chicago mob. A porn shop owner doing business in an area controlled by the outfit, We Met was forced to pay a monthly tax by the crime syndicate, and he was fed up with it. For months, he secretly recorded conversations with notorious gangster Frank Schweiss, compiling evidence for the FBI. In the final chapter of our three-part series, Confessions of a Mob Informant, we met tells us about those final hours as an informant testifying against Schweiss and why he's finally telling his story. I, I, I won't see you for a while. I gotta, I gotta hit it. I gotta go somewhere. Something come up. So I don't know Using underworld jargon for a gangland murder, this January 1988 recording shows Frank Schweiss detailing his mob doings to Red We Met. For months, We Met had been secretly recording Schweiss, who, according to authorities, was a suspect in several murders. The FBI was closing in on him. Was there any point in time where you thought there was a weight lifted off your shoulders? The day they arrested Frank. The day they arrested Frank, September 15, 1988. We met recalls that day. Agents, they set it up, they called me. I was out of town. I had bought a new home, new location. And uh, they told me to come in. And during that period of time, uh, uh, they had maybe a half a dozen agents in my home hiding in closets and radios, and they had airplanes following them. I had put a call in to them, told them it was an emergency. I had to see them. And he came to my home, and he came in and says, well, you know, he asked me what, what the problem was, and I said, I'm going out of town for a while, and I won't be able to see you, and so I want to give you some money just in case, so there's no beef. And he said, why'd you do that? He said, I'd take it out of my kick. You know, he said, you know, you don't need to do that, Red. And I said, well, I want to make sure I'm right with everybody. And uh, when he left the house, the tape went off. I went as usual, I went and turned off the tape like I normally do. Everybody came out of the closets in my bedroom upstairs, the woodwork. Uh, they were all listening on uh, radios. And uh, they arrested him and put the cuffs on him. Do you think at that point Frank knew that you had a role in his arrest? No, as a matter of fact, I was told that uh, they picked the money out. He put the money in his shirt pocket. And they picked the money out of his pocket. It was all marked. It was initialed by me. And they picked the money out of his pocket. And he said, is that all this is about? I'll be out in 10 minutes. And he got downtown uh, to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they showed him one of the tapes. And as soon as he saw the tape, they said his face went white. And he said, I want my lawyer. Did you ever have any communication with him after that? No. None at all. I don't think he wanted any, and I didn't either. The combination of the videotapes and Wimet's courtroom testimony the following year resulted in the conviction of Frank for conspiracy and attempted extortion. At the age of 40, Wimet began his life over again, going into the undercover division of the FBI. Until now, he's never showed his face on camera for an interview. 
As he begins his book tour, he says he wants to be remembered for one thing. That I cared and that other people should care. If you see something going wrong, bring it to somebody's attention. It may turn out to be nothing, but then again, it may be something very important. Frank Schweiss died in July of 2008 in prison while awaiting trial for the murder of two people in Chicago's famed Family Secrets case. To read We Met's full story, you can find his book, Nobody Cares and What I Did About It, by going to www.readwemet.com.